I've been kind of, um, maybe you could call it hypercritical about integrated hypocrisy, but what I'm really trying to do is diagnose how it gets there. It gets there because we start out horizontal. I've said that a thousand times now, and even I'm beginning to understand it. You know, the speaker is almost always the last one to understand what's said. We start out empty. I've said that a lot. We start out horizontal. What I haven't paid enough attention to in describing this whole process of integration is that because we start out empty and because we start out horizontal, that becomes our thinking pattern. The path. The throughput. Remember when I was talking about throughput? You get used to a certain way of doing things. You get used to a certain way of thinking. It's like taking the same route to work every day. If you get used to that same route and you go the same way every day, if you were to change the route, you would be uncomfortable. It would seem wrong. It would seem bad. It would be unfamiliar. You would have a queasiness about taking a different route. There'd be even a little sense of fear and danger. Because your body is horizontal. Your body gets used to a certain path, a certain habit. That's why it's so hard to lose weight or exercise until you get into the habit of eating a certain way, exercising a certain way. Your body's going to fight it. It loves what it's used to. It does not like change. Now, we kind of all know that. At the same time that we can say that this is how it is, there are certain paths that really are more efficient than others. So it isn't strictly a function of getting used to a certain path and not wanting to change. But if the path you're used to is not more efficient or is not good, you're going to call it good because you're used to it. And this is essentially the problem that we have as humans, is that we start out with whoever are our parents. They're human too. They grew up once empty like we are, and they had people who put them on a certain direction, a certain path. And for better and for worse, that's really how they came to operate. It's like the, it's like Windows. Okay, you know, people don't want to move off XP to Vista and then Windows 7 and God forbid Windows 8 and even worse, Windows 10. Now, part of the reason they don't want to move is because they're used to and when you're used to thing A, you'll make all kinds of excuses about not moving away from thing A. And to a certain extent, whatever you say are your excuses, you're going to be right. Even if thing B is better, there's a certain, what do you want to call it, efficiency that you get from being used to thing A. Okay? Vista was truly worse in its navigation versus XP. Seven, uh, Windows 7 is truly worse than Vista. Windows 8 is truly worse than everything. And Windows 10 is actually worse than 8. In a lot of ways. Okay? But, if you got used to Windows 8 and that was what you were used to, then you wouldn't want to go back to XP, even if it is better. And it is better in certain respects. It's 100% customizable. The search actually works. Search doesn't work too well on Windows 8 and 10. A whole lot of things that don't work too well on Windows 8 and 10. On purpose, they don't work well. 
Windows, you know, the guys who did at Microsoft decided they don't want to preserve some of the functionality that was in XP and Vista in 7. And the reasons that they actually consciously made. Okay, fine, but if you're used to those things, you don't want to move. Okay, but if you got used to Windows 8, you're not going to want to move from that. If they come up tomorrow with an entirely different interface versus Windows 10, people will complain about it, rightly or wrongly, because they're used to it. The same thing applies to all this business about God. When you're a baby, you're around people. Those people have certain beliefs about God. Those beliefs have certain thought patterns and paths. And that's what you learn and becomes your path before you even know how to discern whether it's good or not. So you're used to it. So you're integrated with it. So to you it's familiar. And if it's familiar, it's good. Even if rationally it isn't good, you'll still want it. It's an amazing thing, and I, I don't mean to sound critical because it's true for everybody, but I've listened to a great many um, atheist videos. And there's always a, a, a sort of tone of disappointment and hurt when they talk about their deconversion or that they don't believe in God. There's an undertone like, I wanted to believe and I believed in this idea about God and he disappointed me. And so now they're sort of like angry. The belief that they had had was in their minds now, of course, unjustified. And I, I don't doubt what they say. They're very sincere people. They really are. I, I haven't met a single one of them who I would call a liar or dishonest. They're hurt. And that's the way we are, too. We get used to a certain method of thinking, a certain pattern. And then it gets disrupted. We're hurt. We feel betrayed. We feel lied to. Something we believed in, a path of thinking. A path. Like a road that you take to work. You did this, and then you did this, and then you did this, and then you did this. So then X is supposed to happen. We all go through that a lot. After all I did for you, you told me if I do this and this and this and this, it's going to work. You get your latest edition of Windows and it barks. Because why? Because you trusted in the path. And you trusted in the path because someone familiar to you or someone you liked explained a thing or said a thing you wanted to believe. Right or wrong doesn't matter. You wanted to believe it. That's a horizontal path. Somebody said something you wanted and it didn't turn out right and now you're upset. I'm not talking about whether you're right to be upset or wrong. doesn't matter. It disrupts the path that you were on. That's the point I'm trying to make. You get integrated into a path and you want that path to work. You believe in the path you're on. It first becomes familiar and then you believe in it. Or you believe in it and so it becomes familiar and you expect a certain result. And if that result doesn't occur, then what happens? You lose faith. Now, the integration of hypocrisy then is primarily because we are trying to follow a path 
that we're told is right. It's amazing how hypocrisy is called politeness. And we that's why we're hypocrites. We think it's polite. We think it's the right thing to do. We'll justify it. Hypocrisy is a path. Oh, you shouldn't say this. Oh, you shouldn't say that. Oh, you should be nice, even when you don't want to be. That's called polite. It's actually hypocrisy. There's a fine line between being hypocritical and, uh, what, having good manners. If you vehemently disagree with somebody and you're in the middle of a party... You're not going to sit there and throw a tantrum in order to be honest. That's not hypocritical to just be quiet. But it is hypocritical if you say, Oh yes, oh yes, I agree, I agree. When you don't. See the difference? Psychophancy is hip hypocrisy. But a lot of people can't tell the difference. Why? Because the, the path in their mind is that there is no difference. See, this is the, the kicker here. It's a combination of something you're used to with definitions you're used to, and you will color your interpretation and therefore your behavior and your beliefs based on whatever ever path you got used to. And to you it's not hypocritical. But it is horizontal. And it is entirely based um, upon a sort of, as it were, philosophy about how you're supposed to fit in with everybody else to the extent of sacrificing whatever the truth might be in favor of fitting in that's really uh, right up there with Adam choosing the woman over God fitting in that's the human race and you'll keep you'll have a lot of misgivings about it or maybe none depends on how aware you are It also depends on how much of a conscience you have. See, a lot of people really don't have a conscience. See, in order to have a conscience, you have to have a set of standards that are independent of human agreement. If human agreement is your standard, then you'll just be pliable with whatever group you fit into. Fitting in will be your standard. And it doesn't matter at all what objective truth is. Now, I'm saying all this because the horizontal paths that we take are pretty much largely based on fitting in. They're not based on what might be objective truth. Because objective truth has nothing to do with fitting in. Objective truth might fit in, and it might not fit in. But the human race, every single epic of history shows... People only care about fitting in. Hitler's Germany could not have existed if people didn't care about fitting in. Fashion. I, I, I can't even imagine anybody in his right mind going to a fashion show. I have yet to see a decent fashion design for at least the last 20, 30 years. Now I can remember. I'm trying to remember a time when I saw a fashion show that was worth watching. People just don't know how to design clothes anymore. They just don't. And yet everybody just oohs and ahs over the models as they walk down the runway all looking like I don't know, Auschwitz people. The snotty attitude. Really haughty. They're taught to, to act like that on the runway. Taught to. 
And then, you know, and then you got politics. You just walk into a bar. Everybody thinks that they're supposed to act like little Miss Snooty Tunes. A little Mr. Arrogant. And that's supposed to be sexy. It's supposed to be sexy to walk around unshaven. Does a man realize that kissing a guy who's unshaven is the most uncomfortable thing that you can impose on a girl? But that's supposed to be sexy that he's unshaven? It hurts. I mean, I remember it from four years ago. That was the last time I remember kissing anybody. Maybe it wasn't quite that long ago. It was a long time. I remember hating it. But do women realize how ugly it is to a man that she slathers her face with lipstick and makeup and mascara and eyeshadow? She looks more like a whore than she looks like a woman. Most guys will tell you if you get them able to be honest, they don't like that makeup. And yet women will dot their eyes under and over with all this white cream and they look like clowns. And that's supposed to be attractive? You see what I'm getting at here? People are doing all these kinds of behaviors without thought about the intrinsic value of what they're doing. Uh, living on an idea of fitting in. Now, the biggest point about all this is that with all this horizontal thinking and the fitting in pattern, irrespective of the intrinsic value of whatever it is that you're doing, makes it really, really, really hard to contemplate, understand, analyze anything whatsoever about God. Everything but God's vertical. So that's why we come up with our goofy zombie-like ideas about how to worship God with all of our chants and special clothing and, and weird looks in our eyes and stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, count the beads. As if that's supposed to impress him. It impresses us. And yet we wouldn't treat each other that way. Because we can't conceive of how to think about God at all. Now, what makes this particularly difficult is that when you try, even if you want to know God, since all of your thought processes are going horizontal and are all based around the kind of cultural milieu that you either are or grew up in, your attempt to understand God on your own is always going to just yield some kind of goofball set of conclusions, and the human race is full of those things. I mean, come on. In Hinduism, you pour liquid butter on a wood statue, and that's considered a holy activity? Seriously? Bathing in the Ganges? Letting cows walk around? Okay, but is counting beads any better? Bobbing in front of the Wailing Wall, that's somehow more, more intelligent. God's going to be pleased that you're bobbing in front of the wailing wall with your little pay ass dangling. Seriously? So we can't process vertical thinking. So when God says in Isaiah 55, my ways are not your ways, nor my thoughts your thoughts, now maybe it's a little easier to understand why. Okay, but if that's true, and of course it's going to have to be, then how do what happens? How can you know God? Now, the amazing, most amazing thing about this to me, and maybe to you, and maybe there's something more, is that the, he set up a whole process of learning him that's based on all the horizontals in your life. That's part of also what the Mosaic Law was designed to do. Yeah, it was a satire. But you have to go through those same horizontals to take care of your body 
So the idea was to be reminded of some meaning that's associated with God while you did it. So that while you did the horizontal thing, you could learn the vertical thing. And it would ideally, therefore, be as natural to think about God when you did the horizontal thing. Once you started doing it often enough. Because you would get used to the meaning vertically that went with the motions you did horizontally. That was the integration plan. Now, the funny thing about it though, is that once you are in it long enough, you absolutely lose all of your taste for the horizontal. You lose your taste for fitting in. You lose your taste for human approval. You lose your need for body stuff. Even though you still retain those needs, they don't matter so much to you anymore. It becomes even kind of dangerous. Because you get so interested, like Daniel was, you know, when Daniel's talking, what was it, Daniel 9 or Daniel 10, he was in mourning and actually on Passover, he's not eating. I don't know if you noticed that. And of the commandments that were in the Old Testament, in the Mosaic Law, Passover is one of the high holidays. Yom Kippur, you fast, not Passover. On Passover, you eat. He's not. He gets this vision, so it means that even though he was technically violating the Mosaic Law, he gets his vision. I think he was in mourning for Dar Darius the Mede, who had just died. I want to say it's Daniel 10. I forget if it's 10 or 11. But he's fasting and he's telling you what month it was. And the day. And you're like, oh my gosh, that's Passover. The one day he's supposed to be eating. He's not. You know, I'll, I'll check it and I'll put a correction in the video description if I'm wrong, but... That's what I remember now. Pretend for the sake of argument is true. Then the Mosaic Law, it just like Paul says, what was it, Galatians 3, is a school teacher. Grammar school teacher, particularly. For a higher understanding. But once that higher understanding starts to burgeon in you, then you can't look at life the way you used to. You can't process things horizontally anymore because God's thoughts are starting to become your own. And does that mean that you sin less? No, you probably sin more. At least I think I sin more. But you are becoming less human in your thinking. You're becoming vertically oriented in your thinking. And instead of thinking about the, the way a horizontal path goes, me, he, she, it, us, it's, these things, eyes on things and people, the actual thought process, the root of it, R-O-U-T-E, like a map, like road, is goes more like this. What's the principle here? What's good about this? What's bad about this? What's right and wrong about it? Not how do I feel about it? Not what so-and-so thinks. You know, all mankind's thought processes go by personal attitudes or persons around you and what their opinions are. Everybody's all hung up on their own opinions. Well, my opinion is, who gives a flip what your opinion is? What's the truth? What are the facts? People are very proud of their opinions. 
How many times have you heard people say, well, my opinion is, well, my belief is, honey, I don't care what your belief is. Give me some facts. I mean, you know, belief is like underwear. You change it tomorrow. But the facts are supposed to remain. And your belief can change tomorrow. And it's not wrong if it does. If tomorrow I find out that all I believed about God is a total lie, well, I'll just change my mind. But some people are very threatened by that. Why? Because they're thinking horizontally. The horizontal path is all about me, 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 and all the people around me, and what do they think, and what do I think, and we all got to be in agreement. That's horizontal thinking. Vertical thinking is not like that. The path of vertical thinking is what are the facts, what is the truth, what should I deduce from these facts that I know, what more facts do I need to know better. And in God's particular case, and, and what was it? Psalm 130, Psalm 139? No, Psalm 138 too. Wow, Psalm 139 is right after that. Okay, Psalm 138, 100, Psalm 138 2C. God puts the truth above his own name. And the word name there, Shem in Hebrew and Onoma in Greek. Uh, means personhood, reputation. In other words, it, it, the self doesn't matter. And that's not being unselfish. But if you're a horizontal thinker, because self is first, you call it unselfish in order to pride yourself on not priding yourself. So then you're making the sin of pride by telling yourself that you're being humble. See, there's no way out. Horizontal thinking is a complete opposite of God's thinking God wants to wants to look at the truth first wants to look at the facts first wants to decide what the, the you know um, right answer is first of course he's God he's omniscient he knows all those things but the focus here is wants to he doesn't want to decide a thing based on how he feels about it. He wants what the truth is first. And you say, well, but God is truth. And God designed truth. And everything God says is truth. Yeah. But the truth is free. See, it's the whole start of this series. And I frankly have the same problem with it that most people do and that Satan does, which is, but how can you stand this? Truth be free? Free to go against you. See, God is truth and he designs truth to be free because God is free. Okay, that sounds all real nice and everything. Until you stop to think about what that means. Free to be everything he's not. So then truth really is more important to God than God himself. That's not how we think. We can't afford to think that way. The human race is all me, 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 me. And, you know, truth is like a servant of me. We say otherwise because we're hypocrites. But the point of fact is... That truth is a, what do you want to call it, weapon, a tool that we use for the benefit of the self. That's not how God thinks about it. God thinks of himself as a tool for the benefit of truth. And he doesn't even want to be God if it's going to be different. You say, well, how's that different from me using truth to benefit myself? It's just the opposite. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with God's thinking here. I should, but I don't. I'm just like you. Something feels good to me, and I want to make it true because it feels good. Or because I like it. And you can argue, and it's most, you know, what do you want to call it? 
refined form. God likes truth being free above his own person and therefore that's how it is. Okay, but notice the difference. You want a thing to be true and so you call it true. God wants a thing to be true and he calls it true. But what does he call true? Anything that's free to be whatever it is for him or against him doesn't matter. Would you do that? Would you baptize a universe where it's free to be whatever it is, whether it likes you or hates you, whether it feels good to you or not, and then ensure its existence even when it goes against you forever? I don't know about you, but I would not do that. God is doing that, has always done that, will always do that. Satan looks at that, and I'm kind of in Satan's camp here. Satan looks at this God person with this insurance of everything, truth be free, and says, you know what, you're a real sadist or masochist, one or two. I mean, there's no other way to read Isaiah 54, Isaiah 55, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, and uh, 3, 15 through 19. There's no other way to read it. There's no other way to read Psalm 138 too. God puts the truth above his own name. What was the other one? Psalm 89 verses 14 and 15. So Psalm 37. Don't feel guilty or feel bad about the wicked. The idea of focus there is that the wicked are all about me, 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 me. I get mine, I get mine, I get what I want. Yeah, okay. It's fine. You get what you want. What do you get? God's big point is, yeah, okay, fine. You want to serve the me, 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 and you want to bend truth to serve the me, me, me? Go right ahead. Will it get you? Because God has that choice. He didn't want it. And that's what really this whole conflict's about. Which way do you want to choose? The way God chooses? And, and, integrate with that which you can't do on your own and he'll verticalize you so to speak or do you want to keep going on the horizontal path which is what Satan's saying is the right way to go after all we are not God yeah okay but here's the catch if you want God's path my ways are not your ways Isaiah 55 then there's going to come a time, and I'm in it now, but I'm not through the course, where you are literally alien versus everybody else. There is a sort of like, you become divorced from yourself. His thinking is so much a part of you, not that you sin less, it's just that you're like at odds with yourself. My life just doesn't mean anything to me anymore. I'm looking vertically at everything, and I'm like, why is it here? Why is this any good? And I keep on saying, to God, I'm not integrated enough with you. Of course not. I'm also no longer integrated with this world. So I'm neither horizontal nor vertical. It's kind of like, what was that? That Rudyard Kipling poem. Tomlinson, I think his name was. I'll try to put a link in the video description. It was Tomlinson. Tomlinson was a po poem writ written by Rudyard Kipling where Tomlinson was not quite bad enough for hell. Of course, Kipling didn't understand the Bible to save his life. He wasn't quite bad enough for hell and he wasn't quite good enough for heaven. So he couldn't. He wasn't allowed to actually die and be sent back to this life. Which is your typical, you know, misunderstanding by Christians and non-Christians alike that somehow you have to be good to go to heaven. Which the Bible never says. There wouldn't have been the cross if we were good enough to go to heaven on our own. It's because we can't get into heaven on our own that there had to be a cross. That's what distinguishes the Bible from every other holy idea on the planet. You can't do it. He did it for you. Quit trying. Just believe. Pretty simple. And we hate that message. Because horizontally, we like the path that says, Oh, you deserve this. 
Oh, you're such a good boy. Here, you get $5 and, and, and a bicycle. That's the, that's the God we want. And yet, when God doesn't do what we tell him to do, well, I don't believe in you anymore. And then we account ourselves good persons. I'm a good person. God help you if you have to look at the personal ads. Ugh. I'm a fun-loving person. Really? If you have to tell me you're a fun-loving person, then you wouldn't know how to spell fun. I feel sorry for people who date. Especially if they go through the personal ads. Ugh. I do this for a living, I do that for a living, and I like certain movies, and I like certain activities, and I'm thinking, can you be more shallow than that? That's horizontal thinking. That's what the world wants God to fit into. But he's not like that. Okay, but the flip side of that is, if you start to know him and learn and live on Bible, and you've been at it for a while, you stop being horizontal. And then you're at odds with everybody around you, including yourself. Now here's the big, the big test. How horizontal people are. Is a person's belief based on the beliefs of those around you? Is where you go to church because you like the people there? If you were asked what you believe about God, do you actually think about the answers? Or are you just a good parrot? When you listen to one person versus another person, or you talk to one person versus another person, or get into the discussions about God, is it like, you know, platitudes? Is it like just hearing a good movie? Or because you like the sound of a person's voice? Because, honey, if that's what it is, you're, you're horizontal. There ain't no chance you're ever going to learn God. I can't tell you how many people have written me emails that I've just, I've just cut them off. Because I can tell almost immediately, oh, they just like the sound of my voice. It has nothing to do with him. I don't have time for that. And it's not good for them. So ask yourself, are you a groupie? I'm not talking about me. I'm just talking about, about anything. How many Christians call themselves Christians so they can pride themselves on being Christians? Because really what they are is groupies. How many people go to the church that they go to because of the social life? With the other Christians there. Or the pastor. That was a big problem in my church. The guy actually taught good doctrine. But people didn't go there for that. They went there because their friends went. And when you'd ask them what he taught, oh, they could parrot it off. They were real good at memorizing. But they didn't understand a thing. And I shudder to think, I wonder how much of the time I had been there. Was I like that? I don't know. maybe two, three years into it, I thought, you know what? If I stay here, I'm going to be like these people. I just want to know God. I don't want the social life. Because it's all like Mr. Potato Head. Okay, well, the, but that's true in any church. It's not, it doesn't really matter whether the pastor's correctly teaching or not. They turn into little clubs 
Okay, then even if your pastor is correctly teaching, is it the teaching you're there for to learn God, or are you there because it's comfortable? That's the litmus test of integrated hypocrisy that we all need to kind of run on ourselves. Yeah, I believe in God. Okay, why? And are the answers to that question canned? Do they have an awful lot to do with people around you that you like? And they're doing it, so you're doing it? How much of it is really just personally based on God himself alone? Because someday, you got to go it alone. And if your beliefs are horizontal, then they're no beliefs at all. And you ain't grown vertically. And if you ain't grown vertically, why are you trying to pretend? You want to fit in? Fine. Be honest with yourself. Say, hi, I'm just fitting in. That was the 1940s, the 1930s, the 1950s, the 1860s. That's what people did. They went to church to fit in. It was the acceptable thing to do. Everybody was well-mannered. You dressed a certain way in church and you wore your hats. God help you. And you spoke a certain way, and you stood up, and you sat down, and you were all very nice and polite. That was deemed spiritual. It was totally horizontal, had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with God. And of course, two world wars came out of that. Think about it. And I'm going to go think about it, too.